Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's JK MRC Friday seminar, um, 7th of August 2020. My name is Nathan Fox from the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre at the University of Queensland. Also online, we have Professor Rick Valenta, who's the director of the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre and is currently acting director of the JK MRC. Uh, he'll help us moderate the questions at the end of the seminar. Thank you, everyone, online for joining us. Before we begin, on behalf of the University of Queensland, based here in Brisbane, um, we'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their ancestors and descendants. Um, it's our pleasure to introduce this week's presenters, Professor Alexander Sherman and Dr Thierry Bohr, both from the University of Queensland. Um, Alex Sherman received his diploma degree specialised in geotechnical engineering in 1998 and his doctoral degree in 2005, both from the University of Karlsruhe, Germany. In 2012, he gained his habit, habilitation from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, also in Germany, um, specialising in time domain reflectometry, TDR, in geohydraulics and geomechanics. Alex has worked at the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland since 2010 and was awarded a Queensland Science Fellowship on the further development of spatial TDR in 2012 and also an ARC Future Fellowship in 2018 on using geophysical methods for monitoring erosion processes and embankments. His current research interests involve multi-phase and multi-scale processes underlying important questions on erosion, and the hydraulic and mechanical behaviour of unsaturated soils and subsoils, and the application of dam engineering and tailings dam, dams. Um, also co-presenting today is Thierry Bohr, who, who obtained his master's degree in acoustics from the University of Paris in 2007 and his PhD in 2011 in metrology from the National Conservatory of Arts and Crafts in Paris, France. Um, Thierry joined the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland in 2015 as a research fellow and was awarded an ARC Discovery Early Career Research Award on the further development of dielectric spectroscopy for soil characterization. So with that in mind, um, um, we're going to hear today about a contribution to the key question related to the talents which is when does a soil behave like a soil and how can we observe that? So for the first part, I'm going to hand over to Alexander and he will co-run this um, seminar with Thierry. So thank you, over to you, Alexander. So yeah, thank you for the introduction, Nathan. And uh, let me start by um, thanking um, Jake and Marcy, Nathan and Rick for the invitation to give this presentation. Um, and, uh, and as you have seen, the um, topic is a very, very fundamental general one. So when a soil really behaves like a soil. And uh, I hope that we can shed a bit light on that or somehow make a contribution. Um, let me motivate with um, a presentation or with, a, with a, a, um, a picture from a paper which was published in, a, in Science about tailings and uh, ash ponds and the failure mechanisms. And uh, in this paper, Santa Marina has um, highlighted some keywords like the high water levels, which can lead to failures, a problem which we uh, insufficiently take into account, which is the segregation while uh, tailing sediment, uh, problems with the loose structure of sediments and early cementation, um, overtopping of dams, the compressibility of the material, especially the fines, then weak seams, which might develop due to the segregation and internal piping. So he basically raised already quite, uh, not necessarily unknown, but important topics around the failure modes of, uh, of tailings. And what uh, we recently looked a bit into it is the, uh, uh, the loose sediment structure and um, the early cementation due to uh, geochemical processes. So, um, um, I, because we have a, such a wide audience coming from different areas, I, I had to dig deep into um, lectures for undergraduate students to present some basics first. Uh, for the ones who know them already, I, I apologize, but otherwise, I think it's important because I use different parameters to know what those, these parameters mean. Then the, ad, oops, stop, wait a minute, I will then talk a bit about the other back limits, water retention behavior, then the two main uh, characteristics of soil, the compressibility and strength, shear strength of soils. And then uh, Thierry will take over introducing electromagnetic methods, our uh, try to use ultra wideband dielectric spectroscopy to learn more about soils and uh, spectral induced polarization 
which is an important aspect also for field investigations. Okay, yeah, now to the basics. Um, here you see a phase diagram, very simple. So the constituents of the soil, if, they if we have just the, uh, the three main uh, phases, air, water, and solids. And we use basically volumes and weights or uh, mass for defining then density parameters or water contents. Yeah, so in, it's, a, it, it's a macroscopic kind of approach where we relate then these, these weights and volumes in a way to get a parameter like the void ratio. That's very, that's the one which is only used in uh, uh, soil mechanics, basically, which describes the volume of voids relative to the volume of solids. And it is done because the volume of solids always stays the same, regardless what kind of density we have. Uh, porosity, that's the commonly used uh, parameter for describing a density state. So the volume of the voids divided by the volume, the total volume. And it's related, of course, to the, to the void ratio. Then another very characteristic parameter for geotechnical engineering is the gravimetric moisture content, where we relate the weight of the water to the weight of the solids, yeah, similar to the void ratio, but here with the weight uh, of the solids. We can have, in fact, then moisture contents beyond 100% uh, if we have, for example, materials which can swell or organic materials. And the saturation. And the saturation is then the volume of the water divided by the volume of the voids. If you don't have any air, it must be, of course, 100%. Yeah, and then to the density. I will use these parameters later. Yeah, so to total unit weight. The total weight divided by the total volume gives us an uh, information about the uh, uh, unchanged weight just coming from the, from the overburden. Then something which we call the dry unit weight. We basically assume we have the same distribution of the solid, but take out all the water. And that's what then we call the dry unit weight, so the weight of the solids divided by the total volume. And we need this dry unit weight to recalculate then the gravimetric water content into the volumetric one, which is one which is commonly used more in uh, agriculture, soil science, uh, but also in, in hydrology because it shows the uh, the, um, the, the, the fraction of the volume occupied by the total volume occupied by the water. And then the degree of saturation is then simply the, this volumetric water content divided by the porosity. Okay, so far to these very simple basics. I hope it was not too fast, but we, we will see uh, them all in the, in the course of this presentation. Ah, yeah, another important relationship. G. G is the specific gravity, um, which is basically the density only of the solids, so the weight of the solids divided by the volume of the solids, relative to the unit weight of water. Yeah? So it, is, it, it describes basically the density of the, only of the solid fraction. And if with, uh, with that parameter and under the consideration of full saturation, so here is the saturation, we then can calculate for a given water content what is the porosity or the density state. Yeah? This is somehow an important information then if you have full saturated conditions, you only need to know the water content in order to get an information about the density. Good. So this is uh, a diagram which you will find a lot in textbooks, which describes um, basically the different states of a soil which it undergoes when it dries, starting with the suspension. And that was done very long time ago, as you can see in 1911, Atterberg has defined more or less, I think even seven different states for the transitions of the soil behavior. And, uh, uh, and you can already see on this kind of very schematic pictures, what is an important information. I mean, if you have a suspension, we have a low concentration of solids, the particles are not touching each other. So in principle, they cannot transfer any forces or stresses, but when then water content reduces, the density increases or the volume here reduces and particles start to touch each other. In uh, geotechnical engineering, we basically define the liquid limit as the transition from liquid to a plastic state. The liquid limit test is also very old. 1936, Casagrande has developed the test which you can see here on the two pictures. So it's very simple. We, we make a groove into the soil. We, that's a cup which we then hit on the ground uh, as, uh, for as long as we have a closure of this groove over a length of 
uh, around 13 or 12.5 millimeters. Um, and then the water content where that happens at 25 hits, that's what we define the liquid limit. It's a very simple test and there are substitute tests, um, but this is so carved in stone in geotechnical engineering that it is basically a standard, uh, as a standard test used everywhere in the world. Then for the other transitions, we have here the plastic limit where then um, the soil um, uh, experiences more strength because we have a higher density. And as you can see here, it's related to the shear strength, 1.7 and 100 times more for the plastic limit. Uh, this test is also one which was suggested by Atterberg to basically roll a little sausage out of the soil. And when it starts to fall apart uh, with a thickness of three millimeter, then we, uh, we have theoretically uh, uh, reached this plastic limit. Also for that, there are up substitute tests, but this is basically the standard test. What these both tests have both in common is that the sample is usually remolded. So we mix it in a certain water content, let it homogenize, and then we do the test. We change the water content and do the test again and so on. But we shear, we, we shear the soil either by knocking it or by rolling it. And, and that means we, um, we deform it, yeah? The next test, which is the shrinkage limit is conducted differently. We also use usually remolded samples, yeah? Or mostly we use remolded samples, but then we basically start our test at a state a bit higher than the liquid limit, let it dry out. It follows then more or less a 100% saturation line. I will show an example a bit later. And where it then leaves this line, this is where then we define the shrinkage limit. And as you can see, they are in a certain order, starting with highest water content, liquid limit and plastic limit and shrinkage limit. For a red mud, I have here collected the data, which I will also refer to in the course of this presentation. So the liquid limit between 48 and 55, the plastic limit smaller, around 32 to 37, but you see already the shrinkage limit is here around 42, yeah? But as I said, yeah, the liquid limit is in geotechnical engineering considered as a transition from a soil-like state, yeah, because we assume that no, we know that it's the transition from liquid to plastic, um, but we also assume that we have from there on a recognizable increase in shear strength or an, on an increased stiffness. And we can, what is important, start from there, apply the effective stress concept. Yeah? And you can see here uh, on the plastic state, the soil behaves more plastic and on the liquid state, viscous, yeah, which is also very important information because it relates to the question whether we have a stress dependent or a shear rate dependent behavior. So this is now an example of such a test. I have now to say that in this case, we used an undisturbed sample with a good reason, which I will present a bit later. So an undisturbed sample was used as initial condition. So this is the 100% saturation line calculated with these equation I've shown before and the specific gravity of 3.3, which is very high. And what is normally done is that we look what is the density at the very end at 0% water content. And we use them basically that point on this line to determine the uh, uh, shrinkage limit. If we would have done this test under remolded conditions, the shrinkage limit would have been not much smaller. Yeah, it's a bit smaller, maybe 38, what I've seen in, uh, in, another, uh, in another result. Yeah, so now we, I've shown here, where is the liquid limit range? It is at a higher water content and the plastic limit range at a lower water content and shrinkage limit is in between. This already shows that uh, tailings has a very particular kind of behavior so that we don't see this normally, normally we experience for soil distribution of the highest water content liquid limit and the plastic limit and then the shrinkage limit. So this is uh, something I will show later in other, in other uh, graphs as well, that we have a very particular behavior of tailings. So let's now continue with the water retention behavior. Um, if we have a very simple problem with ground surface, a water table in some depth, and we can measure different depths, the water, uh, the water pressure, we can simply calculate us ourselves here hydrostatic pressure. That's uh, well known and not not very not very complicated. Uh, the soil we can simply assume to have full saturated conditions. Above the water table, however, if we have 
um, a continuous water phase, we should be theoretically able to measure a negative pressure, which also is more or less hydrostatic, but in a negative sense. Yeah? And the water content distribution ranges then according to this, um, to this um, uh, pressure. And, uh, and that is what we call the water retention behavior, which we need to know, for example, to be able to calculate water balance processes, uh, not only within tailings, slopes, embankments, whatever the material is we are looking at. So at unsaturated conditions, uh, we need to know basically this information and how we can get that. So we, in geotechnical engineering, we basically um, uh, took over a concept which comes from uh, rather soil science, which is shown here. Um, it is the water retention curve, which describes basically the water content. In this case, it's the volumetric water content uh, versus the uh, uh, pressure head difference. And the pressure head difference is nothing else than the suction as a, as, a, as a difference in pressure between water and air phase divided by the unit weight of water. So basically what it shows us here is also a water column, yeah, so that we basically can say that's in centimeters. So in, uh, um, ten, in, 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 in a 10 meter height, we have then basically uh, an, uh, an, uh, an suction of, of, that's the, it's the suction, 10 in the power of, um, of three, or a PF of three, we have then here a water content of around 5%. Um, the way we measure this, uh, this curve is either by applying a uh, suction through the water phase and the uh, uh, difference in, 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 in the height of the lower end of the water uh, of the sample and the, the water column we apply is then the suction we apply on the sample. I will show later an example on that. We can also apply the suction by increasing the air pressure. Yeah, that's normally done in a pressure plate apparatus. Or we use a uh, so-called uh, potentiometer where we have a sample, we await equilibrium within a chamber where then at a given temperature, we have then a constant relative humidity. And then we use the Kelvin equation to calculate the suction within the sample. So these are different methods we can apply to in order to get then uh, this information. And that was done also with tailings, of course. And we started this test at an undisturbed, with an undisturbed sample. So now this shows you the evolution of the gravimetric water content yeah, versus uh, the applied suction. The, the, the circular uh, um, um, symbols were measured with the pressure plate apparatus. So basically by applying an overpressure in the air phase and the the, uh, the rhombuses were measured with the dew point potentiometer. But now we need exactly this information because there we know for every single water content, gravimetric water content, what the density is or the dry unit weight. Yeah? And we can then use this, uh, this uh, equation to calculate the uh, uh, gravimetric to the volumetric water content. And with the knowledge of the uh, porosity, which we also can get from the dry density, we can get the saturation. Yeah? So again, the liquid limit range, as you can see, is here in between um, uh, the, uh, let's say, at, at the water content, which is smaller than the natural water content. This 60% is around the natural, was around the natural water content. And we only reach then that water content in this test at suctions, which are very, very high. Yeah. Accordingly, yeah, we have here then the so-called air entry value, as you can see here, we have full saturated conditions up to this point where then for the first time air enters the soil and we get truly unsaturated conditions. And this happens at 400 uh, kilopascal, yeah, which corresponds to a height of 40 meter water column. So what that means, if we would, for example, have this kind of condition in the tailings, yeah, that would mean that as long as uh, and in this case, we should not define the water table as the water table as a visible line between water and air. It is rather what we call the zero, um, zero potential line or the, the line of zero poor water pressure. So if you would measure then with a pressure transducer at that location, zero uh, poor water pressure, that would, would be that line. But above up to 40 meter, the soil stays fully saturated because of this behavior 
unless we don't have any evaporation on the, on the surface. But this is an important information when you think about any water balance processes in tailings. Good, let's continue with the, uh, because this, we need these pore water pressures in order to calculate the stress in the soil. And as I said before, we have the total stress, which is the overburden pressure. So at every single point we can calculate what is the stress, just, just simply by knowing how deep it is in the ground and by knowing the to this total unit weight. Yeah? And just by multiplying total unit weight with the depth, we can calculate what is the stress at that depth, the total stress, uh, and we can do that for the different depths and we get then this kind of distribution of the vertical total stress in the ground. In order to be able to calculate the stress we need to know for calculating any deformations, we need to take into account the pore water pressure. And that's what we do with this effective stress concept. And the, this effective stress is the stress which is experienced by the solid particles, is then the difference between the total stress and the pore water pressure. At the water table, where basically UW is zero, we, the, 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 um, the total stress corresponds to the, to the vertical stress. And below this zero potential line, where we have um, positive pore water pressures, we get um, a reduced, uh, a smaller effective stress, an effective stress which is smaller than the, the uh, total stress. But above, where we have then suctions, the effective stress is larger than the total stress. Yeah? So this is somehow important to understand in order to know what is theoretically the stress at this location. Yeah? And the soil should deform according to that stress. And equilibrium, we should experience a point which is described by this test. So that is the standard pedometer test. We have a sample relatively thin, two centimeters or so. We apply a stress on the, on the surface and equilibrium when excess pore water pressures have been released, the applied stress corresponds to the total stress and any deformation, we, we, if we know the initial uh, void ratio, any deformation changes the void ratio. So these are then the points of these uh, equilibriums, yeah, uh, starting from the initial void ratio. And if you would re unload and reload, we would get another stress path, but what I will show you later is basically only, only this uh, initial loading line. And as I said, that's equilibrium. So if we know the, the stress, we should be able to say, okay, at this stress level, at equilibrium, we should have this void ratio. And any difference to that void ratio gives us information how far we are away from this um, um, consolidation, let's say, um, um, status, normally consolidation status. So these are results now for, um, for different materials. And these materials have been remolded before. Yeah? So we had in the black line, it's kaolin, red mud, and pot of Brisbane dredged material. And this were the conduct, uh, these measurements were conducted with the, uh, uh, with the odometer test shown before. Um, now I introduce just the lines of the void ratio if we, if we uh, assume we have water content at the liquid limit. And you see that um, all the curves lie below that line. So we basically start the test at the condition where we assume that we have uh, so-like uh, so -like conditions. But now I highlight to you what is the, um, the void ratio from the undisturbed samples we have used for the tests. And you see we are far beyond of it. So we do tests in a range where basically our soil is not, is not, is not located. Yeah? So that's why we did another test. And now um, that test was developed in our lab um, and the so-called suction induced compressibility test. What we do is to allow the sample to sediment in this cylinder. We have here an, uh, a ceramic glass plate and then we apply an, uh, an increased effective stress by applying suction, by lowering basically this uh, tube with, filled with water slowly downwards. And our sample, because the effective stress increases, starts to deform due to this effective stress. And these are the results. Yeah? So basically, this is the point where we apply for the first time 0.01 uh, kilopascal. This is, if you calculate, recalculate that into a water table, 
just one millimeter, one millimeter of water table, yeah? And as you can see, we have here a, com a very complex behavior. And regardless of the soil, we see very similar behaviors with uh, three different kind of inclinations. Also for the, for the kaolin and for the red mud, it seems a bit different, but also here we have this kind of behavior. Um, this, these are just as attentions uh, or best fits put in the, the, these transitions. And what is important to understand is that here we have a rather stiff behavior. So with increase of the stress, there is not a lot change in density, but then within a small range, there is a kind of a large uh, change in the density when we increase the effective stress. And then it turns into an, uh, another mode. Um, at the moment, we, uh, we are not fully through with our investigations concerning that. Uh, but at the moment, we think what we, what we do is that we overcome here hindered sedimentation, yeah? So that we have some, because when you think about it, this uh, void ratio means that we have uh, more, double the, amount, double the volume of voids than the volume of solids. We can't really assume that the particles really touch each other, yeah? But they interact through the bound water phase. And uh, from a certain point of view, a point of stress, we then uh, get this, kind of a collapse-like uh, densification until we probably reach exactly that point where particles start to transfer stresses. So that's why one possibility to say, well, the soil starts to behave like a soil is when we have this transition yeah, from the one behavior to the other. Yeah? And as you see, only within the case of the red mud, it corresponds to the, uh, to the liquid limit. In the other cases, the water contents are, are higher, or let's say the density states, cor the corresponding density state is lower. We can do a similar consideration also for, for the shear strength. Yeah? So when do we have really an increase in the shear strength? I don't have any, any results here with, the, uh, with uh, uh, tailings material, but with a uh, substitute material, which is a mixture between with kaolin and silica powder. Here the, there are the, um, the, uh, the different mixtures. So in one case, blue is 100% kaolin, 88% kaolin, and correspondingly then 12% silica powder and so on. Here are the liquid limits, the Casagrande method, which I've shown before. This is the substitute method, as you can see, gives different results. And uh, there is the average. And this um, test was conducted with the so-called fall cone test. Yeah, this is this substitute test for the liquid limit. So basically we fill a chamber, uh, a cylinder with a, with a soil remolded at a given water content. We allow this cone to penetrate into the soil for five seconds. And then we look how deep is that cone penetrated into the ground. And then we can calculate out of, out of that penetration depth, the, um, the shear strength, yeah. And this is another test. So basically what we did here was to use for uh, more soil-like conditions, to use the, the fall cone test up to a certain water content where we can't then use it anymore. And then we did some, uh, oh, that's wrong. That's not the fall cone, that's, that's the vein shear test. That's the vein shear apparatus. So what that does, I think uh, you might know that test. We have a vein which is rotated in the soil. We measure the torque and from the torque, we can then calculate uh, the shear stress. And we can use this stress for much higher water content. So basically in combination, we have then the full picture of uh, the shear strength from very high water contents to lower water contents. And this is the combination. And what I've introduced as well, uh, here is vertical lines, the, uh, the average liquid limit. Yeah? But in order to basically say, okay, where does the soil really start to change dramatically its shear strength? You would rather look for an approach where you use some tangents in the lower tail and where it increases and to use then the points there for um, that kind of soil-like behavior. And as you can see, I did that for the, uh, the purple line. So basically here the 64% of kaolin and the uh, red, which is for 88% kaolin, we are quite a bit away from the liquid limit. So it seems to be that the liquid limit is not really providing us the information we want to when the soil starts to behave like a soil. 
So uh, come then to the conclusion for that first soil part. The liquid limit seems to be an inadequate predictor for the question when a soil starts to behave like a soil. But look, the liquid limit has a very practical reason in geotechnical engineering. It's good that we have it because it really allows us to classify the soil. But I think for that kind of question, we would need to rethink what we, what we use as a predictor. Uh, in terms of both the compressibility and the shear strength, um, the, 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 the start of the soil-like behavior seems to occur at the higher water content than the liquid limit. I think that was quite clear from the results I've shown to you. Um, one important question which is connected to that is whether we are allowed to use um, concepts from mechanical concepts for soils outside this, uh, this liquid limit range. And I mean, I'm talking about effective stress concept or constitutive relation, uh, relationships which are based on friction, for example. Um, the uh, effective stress concept, I've used it for basically calculating for the suction-induced compressibility test, the, uh, uh, the effective stress, but uh, strictly speaking, probably I was not allowed to use it, but I've done it and it worked to some degree. Conclusion two to the relevance of the tailings. Yeah, tailings materials remain fully saturated above the zero potential line or the water table due to the high air entry values. And that can be up to several decimeters, so 40 meters, maybe even higher, depending on what kind of uh, tailings it is. And this is an important information one has to keep in count, uh, into account because any water, any water balance processes must not necessarily lead to changes in water content. Um, the compressibility of tailings and um, the tests I've shown was of course after sedimentation. So young tailings shows a very complex behavior with this collapse-like acceleration. Let me go quickly back again to, to, to this slide because there was one aspect which I didn't uh, mention, but which, which is important. So this is fresh tailings. So the test was conducted basically in a relative short time frame. If we would assume that we could uh, that some geochemical processes lead to set, uh, some cementation, that kind of collapse could be dragged out, yeah, basically because it, the, the, the soil uh, the tailings material would not further consolidate, yeah. Any small change in stress could then basically lead to this collapse-like uh, uh, behavior, which in turn might then be a trigger for the uh, for fluidization and the failure. Uh, of that tailings material. So I think um, that there is um, hidden the, uh, um, uh, the, the answer to the question under which conditions and uh, uh, tailings might fluidize. So let's go back to the conclusions. Undisturbed tailings samples show very low densities. I mean, I was very surprised myself when I prepared this, uh, this uh, presentation and I related basically the, the natural condition to, uh, the, to, to the information uh, measured in the lab. Um, so that is something which uh, is definitely an, a problem which is related to dewatering of tailings. Due to the geochemical processes, the consolidation process might be impeded or even prevented. That's what I tried to mention uh, to say before. So there is, uh, is then the potential that we have a quite large um, um, danger of a collapse-like behavior and collapse-like failure and a corresponding um, fluidization. And, and that gives now the link to what Thierry will now present. The density state of a soil is an important predictor. So if you know the density of a soil, we can assess from the position within a structure what is the approximate stress. We can then uh, somehow predict or assess the mechanical behavior if you know the both the stress and and the uh, corresponding density. Yeah, this is one of the important questions we would like to investigate in future. Also, in uh, in collaboration with SMI, the Ermansu and Traki, uh, and in Mining Three with Ruslan Puskasu, we have here this uh, a newly kind of established and still under development UQ Sustainable Engineering Design Scale Up Facility which allows us to do large scale testing on tailings materials. We have here eight basins, which can be used for large scale lysimeters, for example, or for any kind of run out or failure test and a 40 to 50 meter long 
uh, con uh, concrete beds in two meter high. So these, um, so I'm pretty sure in future we'll see the one or the other presentation where you also will see then some results coming from that new facility. Okay, and now I will hand over to Thierry and so that he can then start with the electromagnetic part of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, so we'll, I will speak and present like the general bi basic of the electromagnetic method for soil characterization that we've been using a lot with, uh, at UQ here. And I will start just with some basic that are required. So probably you, most of you remember Maxwell equation that describe the electromagnetic uh, propagation, uh, the electromagnetic wave propagation. And this equation is always to be linked with a constitutive equation. And the constitutive equation are written for linear materials and isotropes. And this constitutive equation introduced the three electromagnetic properties. So epsilon r, which is the relative permittivity, nu r, which is the relative permeability, and sigma, which is the conductivity. So the big interest why we would measure these three, these three parameters is that they depend, is they depend from physical quantities like temperature, frequency, pressure, and all that. So this means that these material properties, if you manage to measure it, could bring some insight uh, of the soil. So just please note that in this lecture, we'll not talk about magnetic materials, so mu r will be equal to one. So can you move to the next slide, Alex, please? So what is very important, oh, can you, can you, so what is very important is that it's very fundamental to, to remember that the effective, the permittivity and the conductivity are always linked. So if you rewrite the, um, um, con, uh, the, condu the conduction, um, the effective, con effective current density, you can write it in this equation, in these two ways. So depending, if you want to speak more about conductivity or permittivity, and they are both linked. So each of them will have a term of capacitance or an ohmic conductance. So which means that basically, if you measure the permittivity, you will always have some conductivity effect. And if you measure the conductivity, you will always have some permittivity effect. And this is why you speak about effective relative, um, effective permittivity or effective conductivity. So can you move to the next slide, please? So uh, there are lips, heaps of methods that are being used on the field and each method uh, work at different frequency. And what is very interesting about this method, so you can have some measurement imaging. So if we go to the very, very low frequency, you can have ERT, which is electrical resistivity tomography, time domain induced polarization. And then if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you, you can use ground penetrating radar or a small satellite, which is used currently used uh, to measure what to image water content, and on the other end, you have like methods that are used for local measurement, like spectral induced polarization, capacitive probe of frequency or time domain reflectometry. So, what is very important is that there is a lot of methods working at different frequencies. So, it means that if we want to use this method, we need to have some knowledge about the electromagnetic properties, and as you can see they are working on a huge frequency range from millihertz to several gigahertz. So it is very, very important to be able to design and understand the soil properties over a very, very broad frequency range. Can you move to the next slide, Alex, please? So in general, this method works very, very similar. So you basically start with a sensor, which, is, which can work in time or frequency domain. And this sensor has its own spatial and time sensitivity and you try to assess from this measurement the soil physical properties. So nowadays, from let's say the last decade study, this is clear that electromagnetic properties are, seven, are sensitive to several class of properties. First, we'll have structural composition, which is like the water contents, the, permit, the porosity and the soil structure, the way the soil structure is built. You will have solid particle quantifier, which is the particular shape the particle size distribution, which is fundamental in geotech, and the catch exchange capacity. And then you will have the pore water attributes, which is basically the conductivity of water, the mineralogy of, of pore water, everything like that. So the, the way to measure it, basically, Alex, can you move to the next slide? Is that basically it's a two-step process. The first step is to use your in a classic inverse problem to extract the electromagnetic properties. So depending the frequency range, you might want to talk about 
effective permittivity or effective conductivity. And then there is an important step of inversion to extract from this measure of permit, uh, electromagnetic properties the salt properties. So you have different methods. So the most classical, the most easy one is the empirical calibration. So the past years, people have been have getting crazy about artificial neural network, or you have more physical methods like petrophysical model. So here we've been mainly focused on this method because it's more physics, and we are really interested to understand the physical process of soil. Can you move to next slide? So unfortunately, <laughs> this, it's not as simple as we would like to because depending the frequency range, you will have different polarization process. So when I mean polarization, I talk about the way the materials say, get polarized by an electrical field. So if we start, so if we just have a look on this gray curve, so even if we start to the very, very high frequency, you will have this, non and to what is very important is that you have the process depend on the different scales, so in different frequency. So to the very, very high frequency, we'll have what we call the nano relaxation and here we will um, interact interact with the electronic um, properties of molecule of water within the soil so this is typically a microwave so when, when you apply an electric field the molecule of water which have a dipolar moment they will tend to align with the electric field and this will create a specific relaxation due to its um, it loss between the molecule of water then if we go a little bit below in the frequency range we'll have this mesoscale relaxation so this relaxation is basically linked to the fact that the molecule of water, due to the bond water, they will be, they will stick to the surface of clay grain. So this means that because they are, they are somewhat connected to the, to the surface, they cannot move freely. So this is why the relaxation frequency is a bit lower. Then the problem will start to arise when we go to the micro scale, um, micro scale. So you have like, important relaxation, which is called the electrical double layer relaxation. In this, oh, sorry, I think, ah, damn. I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. no, I can hear you. So, sorry, sorry for internet connection. So if we go in this relaxation, so what happened, so it's like, it's linked to the, uh, to the electrical double layer, so the Stern and Gouy layer, because the silica grains are charged negatively, an excess of charge uh, to compensate that, which is called like the diffuse, the Stern layer and the diffuse layer. So when you apply an electric field to that structure, it's going to get polarized. And what is very important is that ions, they're going to move tangen tangently to the surface of the silica grains and they're going to create this typical relaxation. So this is why here we are very sensitive to the chemistry, pro chemistry pro properties and the particle size distribution, because this relaxation is very linked to the particle size distribution. And then finally, if we go to the very, very low frequency range, we have like this membrane polarization. It means that the ions, gonna, when you apply a trick field, so very, very low frequency, the ions gonna stick to the big pore throat and create this typical relaxation. So as you can see, finally, it's not that easy because you have very different process depending the scale and depending the frequency range. So to be able to fully understand uh, this process, we need to be able to measure accurately the electronic properties of soil over this whole frequency range. So this is what we've been doing here at UQ a lot. Can you move to the next slide, Alex, please? So in the high frequency range, we've been using this typical vector network analyzer method, which allows us to access to the high frequency properties from megahertz to tens of gigahertz. So we use typical open-ended coaxial probe, which is basically just an aperture, uh, a coaxial line which is cut, and the electromagnetic energy gonna radiate in the medium, and based with what is reflected, we can access to the electromagnetic properties, or we've been using a lot of coaxial transmission line. So this, in this kind of method, the, the soil which is um, characterized is embedded within a trans uh, waveguide, and we measure what is reflected and transmitted, and from typical equation, we can assess the electronic properties. Can you move forward, Alex? So then if we go a little bit below in what we call the intermediate frequency range from hertz to megahertz, we can use two port impedance methods. This is like 
typical methods. But the problem of this method is linked to the electrode polarization. The ions in the pore, in the pore solution, they will, uh, they will suffer electromigration and they will move toward the electrodes. And this uh, built up ions, they're gonna create a mask that's gonna, that's gonna be very tricky to correct and, that, and, and we might not be able to access the true electromagnetic properties. So in this case, we'd rather use this method from kilohertz to megahertz. And then the last method, next slide, very, very accurate method for the low frequency is to use four port impedance method. So in this case, we use two electrodes to inject current, A and B, and two electrodes to measure the potential. So in this case, because we don't measure when we inject current, we are not perturbated by this electrode polarization. So this can be used for soft soil with this like simple electrodes, or if you are more interested in sandstone or rocks, we use like uh, ECG electrodes with a spring to make sure that there is a pure, pure good, good contact. So, okay, next is. And what is very, very important too, and this is like the petrophysical model. So because for sure, when you get this, um, measure these properties, what is very, very fundamental is to be able to model it. So in, 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 in the scope to develop inverse scheme. So there is two ways to do that. So the most uh, complete and more complex way is to have a complete frequency domain analysis. So the first model was, um, is basically a typical uh, volume average method, homogeneous method that was used with volume average, which give us the possibility to express the conductivity of a soil as a function of the conductivity of the pore water and the conductivity of the solid part. The problem is that the conductivity of solid parts is very, very com complex to comp and depend on the particle size distribution, the ionic diffusion in the diffuse and in the stern layer, and, um, and other parameters. So at the moment, there is models that does exist that are not complete, but there is a lot of work being able to compute these electromagnetic properties. And then if you, and you have like the similar equation uh, for the high frequency permittivity. Uh, so basically this gives us the possibility to express the permittivity. So, and then, this, so this is like still on the work and in parallel you have what we call the simplified model that gives us the, the ability to compute low and high conductivity and apparent permittivity more easily with simplified equation. So can you move to next slide, Alex, please? So we've been using this kind of method to, to reach density and water content, which is our fundamental aspect. So here in this case, so our, our idea is to use like classical tests, like uh, standard, and try to compute the permittivity from the standard test. So in this case, we've been measuring the compacting properties of kaolin with different water contents. So you can see for each measurement, for each uh, sample, we're able to get the electronic properties here. And Alex, can you move to next slide, please? So. Can you, can you go through? So what we've been doing, so basically we use this model in optimization and we have to fit very properly the spectrum. And based on this model, we're able to, re, to achieve, the, to estimate what a pore. So as you can see, with a very, very good accuracy for saturation, a good accuracy for porosity, but a little bit less. So this was very, it's a very, very like cut edge method because we're able to simultaneously estimate saturation and porosity. Can you move to the next slide, please? And then we've been working a lot on this dewatering method. So like Alex showed, it's very, very important to be able to understand like the different states of the soil. So in this test, so basically we made like this classic dewatering test uh, by the loss of mass and to compute the evolution of volumetric properties. And at the same time, we measure the dielectric properties. So then can you move to the next slide, please? So we are finally able to reach, so here on the left, this is the very empirical relationship, which works very well. But for suspension and soft soil, we are able to directly correlate the permittivity measure at one gigahertz with the porosity, with an extremely good uh, correlation coefficient. And at the same time, we use like this model that we've been using to access directly and estimate directly the porosity and the water content. And we are able to achieve the uh, soil characteristic shrinkage curve in mostly in, uh, in mostly in total with a very, very good accuracy. So here, this is the comparison for the automatic estimation and the measurement with geometric method. Can you move to next slide, Alex, please? 
So if we talk about tailings, there is very lot of interest to use this low frequency method called spectral induced polarization. If we consider a soil with uh, pyrite grains and with uh, clays and solid particles, there is a very, very dif in difference in the electrical double layers of clays on the top that's going to create um, a very uh, specific electrical double layer and a grain of metallic, metallic particles will create a very, very different um, diffuse layer structure. So this is very, very typical. And this uh, process is going to be linked to the size. So depending the size, you might, I, you might reach different process on different, relaxation, on different frequency range. And this was used by some authors. So can you move to the next slide? So basically, they've been measuring the uh, low frequencies, so between millihertz to several kilohertz of uh, soil with different water content and different pyrite content. So on the left it was pyrite content of 0.81%. Uh, pyrite content with very high content of 13%. And at the end, they were able to link the chargeability, which is basically just the simple, simply the difference between the high frequency conductivity and the low frequency conductivity to the pyrite content. And this relationship is independent from saturation. So it's mean by combining high frequency method that we could access the water content and low frequency method we should be able to access the pyrite content. So this is why ultra broadband measurement are fundamental in this kind of application. So if you could move to the next slide, please, Alex. And finally, we've, been in, we've started to investigate this biogeophysic application because once again, uh, electrical double layer for clays, they have like a very strict and very defined structure. But if you consider bacteria, you'll have like a brush type electrical double layer structure which means that you will have a different signature in the low frequency range. And again, if you apply an electric field, the way the bacteria are going to polarize is very, very different. So this is why at the moment, this is like very, very new research. Like it's very, the first measurement has been done in 2012. And this is what you would like, what you would like to investigate. And for example, for tailings, especially for, uh, if you use like bio leaching to consume the metallic content, should be able to, mo to monitor the metallic content within time thanks to this spectral induced polarization. So next slide, please, Alex. So just as a conclusion, electro-geophysical method will play an increasing role in geotechnical engineering in the future. But to be able to use this method, it requires a robust petrophysical model and inversion algorithm to take full advantage of these capabilities. So this is what we have been trying to introduce you with this complex frequency domain petrophysical model. And an improved understanding is required with, request, with respect to the interaction between electromagnetic wave of field and the response of soil on various scales. And this is why in this, in this topic, ultra broadband uh, soil characterization in laboratory condition needs to play an important role. And finally, electrogeophysical methods have a great potential for the characterization of tailings from water content and density and estimation up to quantification of mineralogic and geochemical process. And this is especially here in this low frequency range, thanks to this electrical double layer polarization and thanks to the difference of structure between metals and grain particles, we should be able to achieve this kind of objective. Thanks for letting me talk in this uh, seminar. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Thierry, for your contribution there. That's really, um, it's really been very insightful to sort of see the, the technical uh, details behind the monitoring of soils and how you can do this um, on, and apply to tanning stands. So thank you both. Um, we have got a few questions coming in. We've got about five minutes left for questions. So um, the first question uh, was from Joe Kakaza, um, and, I, and it was kind of in relation to the, the segment you did, Alex. Um, Joe's asking if you could explain the variable behavior between Carolyn, the red mud, and the Brisbane port sample in the void ratio versus effective stress plot. Um, Joe's just wondering if this is related to the dominant composition, so the mineralogy, or the particle size, or, or maybe both. And if you could also comment perhaps on the effect of organic material. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, the, um, it's a combination of both. Um, it's not only, I've not shown particle size distributions. I should probably have shown them. Um, but they will play definitely a role in there, especially, um, especially from the 
from the starting point of view, yeah, uh, because um, you would get then with uh, with uh, another grain size distribution, another starting point for the uh, for the um, uh, for this compressibility test. Uh, but also in terms of the stiffness. So when you have more coarse grained materials, they would then uh, behave definitely more um, frictional. Yeah, the the pot of Brisbane has a relatively high um, organic content, and I think that might be the reason why it collapses much earlier than the other soils. But yeah, it's it's definitely a kind of a combination of both. So um, we were, the next question is from Ansar Draki at the SMI. Um, just wondering what sensors can be used in the field to detect the transition to soil life behavior with time um, due to the um, changing chemistry, chemical processes and aging of tailings. Yeah, yeah, we were wondering what, what could be done. I mean, at the end, because of, um, if, if, if we know from laboratory experiments what kind of density we should density state we should achieve in order to have this kind of soil like behavior we basically can use a method which enables us to uh, um, to determine either the water content well the water content would be enough because there is this relationship yeah at full saturated conditions we can calculate and out of every water content the dense uh, the density state but yeah <sighs> Yeah, it, it, the, the problem is with tailings that we can't walk on tailings and do measurements. So it must be then a method which is, uh, which is remote or at least non-invasive uh, to get this information. I think this is where the problem is. So probably a sensor might not be necessarily um, the right way to go rather than maybe with antenna. Or, um, if, 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 if I may add something here, you can see now you have some geophysics method working with drone, and that would be, for example, magnetoresistometry. So basically, you need just to inject a current, and then people use like sensors embedding, like magnetic sensors embedding in drone, and it could be a good solution for tailings because you can't not walk on the top of it. If you in place the sensors, is there a possibility to have real time analysis as well? Is that something that we need in order to monitor the condition of tailing stamps and possible dangers or risks? Um, I've, I've not fully understood. I had to. Oh, do, if we had sensors in place in this tailing stamps, would that provide us with real time analysis that could allow us to monitor changes as they happen and be um, an early warning or a predictor of any possible movement? Yeah, that would be the dream to distribute the sensors while the tailings grows with time and then they're measuring and giving us the information. That would be, of course, the way to go. I mean, the sensors like Thierry has shown, but it is, um, yeah, it, it yeah, there are many complications related to that. Uh, yeah. uh, and one should also not forget that at the end, uh, every sensor gives only a point measurement, yeah. And in order to make an information to be able to give, provide an information about a complete structure, I think the way to go is to combine it then with tomographic methods or remote sensing methods, so that you can use local measurements to uh, to verify or calibrate, and then the uh, large scale measurements to uh, to uh, as an interpolation tool. So a related question from um, Ibrahim Salmi. I'm just wondering if. The assessing the viscosity of the tailings material is also important for analyzing the stability. And again, coming back to the time dependency, if that could be incorporated into, into the relevant analysis. You mean in terms of the mechanical parameters? I think okay. it must be, yeah, in terms of the, the viscosity. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is truly an, an, uh, a very important question. And uh, uh, Mansoor and I and Slan had a lot of discussions around the topic because at the end of the day, we do the tests on a very small time scale. And probably what we need to do is to give the, the samples time in order to measure the uh, parameters. A bit similar what we do with concrete as well, where we uh, basically define then the concrete uh, behavior at different times. And so to get then a kind of a time scale from which onwards we can assume to have something like an a steady, a steady state behavior. Thanks. 
Well, thank you. Thanks for answering the questions. Um, thank you again, Alex and Thierry. I think it was a really fascinating talk and a really good contribution to the work that's being done uh, on townings at the moment. Um, so just, to, just an announcement that next week is a public holiday in Queensland, so there'll be no seminar on Friday the 14th, but we'll be back um, on Friday the 21st of August with Michelle Ash from um, Geovia um, to present on some of the work that they're doing there. So thank you again, everybody online for joining us, and we'll hopefully see you all in a couple of weeks. And thank you again, Alex and Thierry. Thank you Thanks. for having us. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.